At the heart of what we do is exploring limitless possibilities to enrich lives all over the world. Life is precious and we are in the business of cherishing every precious heartbeat. Every day brings a new reason to better our lives. Something to learn. Something to laugh and enjoy. Something to dream. For as long as there's a dream, there's hope. And as long as there's hope, there's joy in living. Reasons for us to keep every heart happy and healthy. Helping us in our endeavor are the many interventional cardiovascular solutions that we create. At our state-of-the-art facilities, we make our stents and catheters. Wires and needles. German excellence and Indian innovation backed by credible research. With the unmatched advantage of being the only company with clinical trials data spanning over 10 years for efficacy and safety. And a one of its kind partnership with the German Heart Center renowned for its pioneering advancements in cardiovascular technologies. It's not surprising we have over 5,000 satisfied clients and a million smiling patients in over 50 countries around the world. We trust good things happen when you follow your heart because there's an ocean of opportunities to discover. And our journey has just begun. Translumina Exploring limitless possibilities of life. Good evening, all of you. Thank you so much for being part of the first masterclass and the launch of Vivo ISR in the international market. And uh, we have a very good news from Italy that first Vivo ISR has been deployed in Italy. And I think with this, I hand it over to Robert Trittini, who is the Chief Commercial Officer based out of Switzerland, taking care of the international business at Translumina. Robert, over to you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, buonasera o buongiorno per uh, i nostri amici italiani. Uh, yeah, as Nancy said, I mean, this is the first uh, uh, webinar and masterclass uh, uh, in Italy. And uh, very, very happy that you know, we could now start launching you know, uh, this uh, great technology, new technology uh, in the international markets. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Magri and, uh, and, uh, and his team uh, for performing you know, the initial cases. This is a really a great step uh, for the company. And, uh, and this session, I mean, this uh, webinar will uh, you know, hopefully tell you everything about the technology and, uh, and uh, the benefits uh, for the patients. So I just have uh, um, uh, three slides. Uh, uh, you saw, you know, part of the presentation in the video, but you know, just to highlight some of the key uh, activities going on in the company. Uh, so we are clearly a, a global company, uh, you know, with our uh, German uh, uh, entity and and since few years also a, a strong uh, Indian entity. So if I need to describe the company. Uh, it was founded in 2000 in Germany and, and mainly through uh, the German Heart Center, you know, Professor Castradi, Professor Schermig and, and the, uh, the uh, you know, collaboration, you know, also with the ISR team, where most of the technology was developed since the beginning, since its inception. Uh, and over the years, the company has grown. And the main, uh, I would say, uh, milestone was a couple of years ago in 2019, when uh, Everstone Capital, a, one of the top uh, uh, funding companies, investors in Asia, uh, found, you know, uh, uh, identified in Translumina, you know, a, a real opportunity uh, in uh, in our cardiovascular business, and uh, and basically uh, uh, invested, you know, funded the company, uh, so now we can grow and move to the next level. So all what will happen is also thanks to uh, that major investment uh, in uh, 2019. So we have basically now very 
clear entities, you know, full pro product development and manufacturing facilities in both Germany uh, and India. Uh, we commercialize uh, nowadays uh, our products uh, in over 50 countries globally through uh, two distinct business units, international and India. This is very important to understand. Most of the international markets are supported and, uh, uh, and served uh, through our German uh, uh, facility and German products in majority. And we have a, a dedicated uh, business unit and, and organization that serves our Indian market, where we also have special partnerships like uh, Shockwave, Impella, Asai, and other companies. Our current port portfolio, just to be uh, uh, just to highlight, you know, uh, what we offer: drug eluting stands with a number of uh, different eluting stands. You can choice PC with uh, a stainless steel platform. This was the first generation, and biodegradable polymer. Uh, uh, the Yukon Chrome PC, uh, the only difference is the platform. Uh, as the name says, it's now with the Finstrats uh, uh, Cobalt Chromium stand platform. The same uh, Cobalt Chromium stand platform is also manufactured in India and it's called Yukon Flex. In fact, we also deploy that technology in certain countries internationally, uh, but most of the countries like in Europe are uh, uh, with our Yukon Chrome technology and the newcomer, uh, this very unique uh, uh, polymer-free eluting stand with a dual drug, the Vivo ISAR that you will learn more today. We have also a bare metal stand, which is the platform, a cobalt chromium of uh, Yukon Chrome called Yukon CC, a semi-compliant balloon, Cathy number four. And very important, we are uh, uh, working on uh, a number of strategic partnerships in selected countries. Uh, as we said, in India, we have exclusive distribution partnership with Asai, Impella, Cis Medical, uh, and Shockwave. Uh, we have signed uh, a, uh, an agreement with QX Medical for an extension catheter for CTOs, mainly called Boosting Catheter for France, and more to come. We are working very actively in expanding our portfolio, not only with internal developments, but also strategic partnerships. Plan for next year, so coming very soon, uh, an ANSI balloon, non-compliant balloon for post-dilatation mainly, uh, very important, CTO balloons, high-pressure balloons, and accessories uh, that we will be able to uh, uh, also uh, uh, get approved, see marked, and deployed in the international markets from our Indian manufacturing. We have in-house uh, accessories like uh, introducers and so forth, and we'll be happy also to uh, commercialize those products internationally. Now, it's not the end of the story. We have a pipeline working also on scoring balloon, microcatheter, drug coating balloon, and very important, the company is very active right now in entering uh, more into the structural heart uh, business, uh, namely with Tavi, uh, uh, a very active project uh, we are conducting with the Cleveland Clinic in the US, and also, you know, some imaging, uh, uh, you know, FFR, QFR, and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, in interesting projects that uh, we plan to uh, finalize, certainly not in 22, uh, it's probably a premature, but uh, definitely in longer term, like 23 and 24. Last but not least, uh, very important, uh, this is one of our priorities to uh, uh, deploy and execute on, uh, you know, best in class clinical programs and educational programs. And we, we are very, very happy and lucky to uh, uh, work in close collaboration with the German Heart Center, Professor Castradi uh, and the ISR team. So just a snapshot uh, on our clinical programs, as you can see here on the Yukon uh, stand, uh, from inception up to now, uh, this year, you know, we also published, you know, a subset of patients, you know, a, a nice publication on the diabetic patients with very nice results. So uh, at each milestone, as you can see here, we published in major index journals. And here up to 10 years follow up comparing to Xions when it comes to the Yukon uh, stent, which by the way is also recommended in the ESC guidelines. And for the newcomer uh, that will be presented today, same thing since inception, up to 10 years follow up 
uh, major publications uh, and, and uh, uh, last year in the JAC for the 10 years uh, follow-up uh, comparing to uh, resolute integrity and this year also 10 years outcomes on diabetic uh, patients. So this is just to give you a snapshot of the company and our programs. Now it is my uh, honor and, and pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Alfredo Galassi uh, as moderator. Uh, Professor Galassi is a full professor of cardiology, chair of cardiovascular medicine, and also director of, of postgraduate school of cardiology uh, in uh, Palermo at the University in Palermo, and honorary consultant in interventional cardiology from uh, Royal Brompton and Harfield Hospitals uh, in the UK in London. So, Professor Galassi, uh, Alfredo, up to you. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. I think you need to unmute. <laughs> so first of all, thanks a lot for your kind invitation and uh, thank you uh, for this kind of opportunity. And it's really a great pleasure for me. I know I've done Castrati for a long time since I was in Catania, working uh, uh, to my first uh, TCI about 20, 50, 20 years ago. <laughs> So it is really a great pleasure to, to see him again uh, in a very uh, good shape and, uh, and, and all of you. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, I'm ready uh, to discuss with you all the issues that basically uh, may, uh, you know, uh, you know, may be faced uh, during this launch of this new uh, drug alum stand. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, I can see also the Italian group uh, together with us, and that would be a great pleasure for me too. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear. So. Uh, Tell me, I mean, what is the, the idea? I mean, uh, uh, how can we uh, proceed for this discussion? And how, what is the idea of discussing the, uh, the, the, the issues? So Dr. Galassi, you already have the introduction of all the faculty with you. So just introduce the faculty, the chairperson, the co-chair and the expert panel and speakers for the today's session. And then we first move to Dr. Kastrati's presentation. Okay. Now, uh, I have here with me the list uh, of the discussion of the uh, core chairperson, which is Dr. Nasser Samor uh, from Pakistan. Yes, he's already and, there. Yes, and the expert panel with uh, uh, basically Antonio Trivisonno, which is working at the, the hospital of Campobasso and um, interventional cardiologist at the, at the cardiology unit of uh, the Cardarelli Hospital in Campobasso. And again, uh, also Dr. Gianludovico uh, Magri, that I can see also him uh, on the right screen, uh, working in the same place, uh, interventional cardiologist uh, in the cardiology of Cardarelli Hospital in Campobasso. Campobasso uh, is one of the uh, places of southern Italy, uh, so not far from Sicily, and so it is a great pleasure for me to be there to, 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 to discuss with them also. Then uh, Dr. Nakul Sindra, which is the Director of Interventional Cardiology at Medanta Medicity, uh, Lucknow. Uh, probably we have met together in the past because I've been missing uh, Lucknow uh, about probably 15 years ago, uh, so probably we met there uh, in this uh, in this, op in this uh, occasion, and also the, this uh, Dr. Nishit Chandra, Nishit Chandra, I cannot see him, which is the director of the cardiology at Fortis Hospital, uh, Fortis Escort Artist in New Delhi, and is also uh, 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 very important. Fortis is a very important. Uh, uh, you know, centers uh, uh, all, over, all over the India, but in New Delhi, it's one of the, probably one of the first which has been developed there. Then we have uh, Dr. Kashif Sheikh, which, uh, okay, it is there. Nice to meet you. 
is the head of the Department of Civil Hospital, Hyderabad, Pakistan. Uh, is, uh, probably we met uh, in, in Dubai uh, for, uh, during a meeting. And also Dr. Ali Ab Abdali, which I can see there on the screen, a lot of you, is the consultant in basic cardiology of the head of the cardiology department of Al-Adada and Tayef Armed Force Hospital in Saudi Arabia. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we have the speakers, which is Dr. Abjit Palshikar, which is the head of the Department of Cardiology at Saigrai Hospital, senior consultant cardiology at Pune. And uh, also with him uh, uh, 15 years of experience. Also Pune, I remember when we started, the, uh, I've been visiting the centers, all of them. Uh, and Pune, I remember, was a very nice place where I meet a lot of nice guys. Uh, Dr. Vijayajit Patil is an interventional cardiologist in Wadala, Nashik, and, uh, and also in practices at Work Art Hospital in Wadala. And Dr. Shrikrant, okay, now I can see all of you on the screen, is a senior consultant, uh, Dr. Sh Shrikant Shetty, okay, hello. Is a senior consultant head of interventional cardiology at Sacra World Hospital at Bengaluru. Bengaluru, uh, I, I think, is in India as well. I don't know. Is in India? Okay, hello. <laughs> but uh, I don't, uh, I've never been there. So probably it's the only place where I've not been. <laughs> okay, so um, everybody of you knows uh, Professor Nan Castrati. Which, is, uh, been, uh, which has been working uh, in this field of interventional cardiology for uh, too many years. I don't want to say that you are too old. <laughs> and I really uh, uh, thank you for this uh, collaboration and partnership and probably uh, the starting of new era of this uh, uh, master class in Italy as well. So thank you to Translumina and to Professor Castrati. So um, thank you, Alfredo. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for bringing nice memories to me from uh, Catania, from uh, Sicily, everywhere there. It's, uh, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you this afternoon and uh, uh, to share some uh, thoughts about the Vivo ESAR stand. So the concerns with polymers are almost as old as the drug inducing stents themselves. I have shown here um, the study of uh, the group of Viermani, and you see there that uh, the uh, animal models used for the drug inducing stents suggested that biomedical polymer in drug inducing stent applications cause inflammation to variable degree in proportion to the polymer mass on the stent. And this is a statement done in 2004. The best testimony of, uh, of the correctness of this statement has been the um, absorbed stent by a resolvable scaffold, which is a fully bioresolvable uh, platform with a strut thickness of 150 micron. Dr. Castese from our group have pulled, has pulled together the randomized trials stand with, and here are shown the uh, it's shown the summary of the results from this meta analysis. Two kinds of outcomes: the target lesion failure and the definite and probable stent thrombosis. For target lesion failure, as an efficacy outcome, you see a twenty-three percent increase in the risk of target lesion failure after one year, it increased to 32% after two years. And most importantly, the risk of stent thrombosis was uh, considerably increased with the absorbed stent as compared to the excited stent, 2.5 times at one year and 3.15 times after two years. 
what are the criteria that should be met by the polymer free drug resistance? It should be efficacious and it should show an improved healing or safety as compared to the other stand platforms. Here, it's a preclinical uh, study of efficacy of the polymer free drug resistance stand in the RET model. The characteristic, the unique characteristic of the our stands was the mycoporous uh, surface. You see here a microscopic uh, appearance of the stand here. And uh, with this stand in the RAT model, the authors of a publication in 2008, they showed by OCT that the intimal area was, was uh, decreased by the rapamycin polymer-free drug loading stand which was also a significant result as compared with the bare metal stand. On the other hand, the safety is a very important uh, parameter for uh, evaluating the drug load stands. A good way to evaluate the safety of the stand is by OCT, and healing score has been proposed as an important parameter to uh, evaluate the safety. And you see here, this uh, healing score published in 2016, which is composed of different parameters, for example, intraluminal mass, malopause, opposition, and uncoverage. Also, uh, excessive neointima, all of them, they compose the healing score. And you have to understand that the, the lower the healing score, the better the safety of the drug load is then. Here, using exactly this uh, healing score, uh, as shown before, a group uh, from uh, collaborators of Patrick Serois has done a study with the polymer-free drug loading stand. And you see here that the healing score improved from 172 at three months to only five at six months. But there is a drawback with the polymer-free drug resistance in, the, in terms of, uh, of drug release, kinetics. Here, although the stent is uh, with mycoporous uh, structure, you see that the release kinetics is much more rapid than with the cipher stent based on the permanent polymer. Here are the two curves up to 30 days showing that uh, much of the drug is uh, faster released with the polymer-free drug load distance. We made a lot of efforts to identify, to identify non-polymeric substances that could slow down the release kinetics of the serolimus. And uh, our interest was focused on probocol uh, due to two reasons. One, that because probocol is highly lipophilic, and so able to slow down the release kinetics of the limus drug. On the other side, propocol is almost the only drug that is proven to be effective in reducing the rate of restenosis after balloon angioplasty. And you see here a publication of New England Journal of Medicine from 97. A lot of efforts, several years of preclinical work showed the effectiveness of and the safety of the serolimus plus probocol eluding stand. First of all, we uh, started with the release kinetics of this uh, combination. And here is the release kinetics from uh, the serolimus uh, dry eluding stands based on the bidegradable polymer. And here are the release kinetics of serolimus and probocol from the polymer free. Uh, combined serolimus and propocol diagnosis stand. What's about the results in animal studies? And you see here several parameters uh, from these animal studies. Here is the bare matter stand, and here is the vivo ESAR stand. And you see that endothelialization was the same as for the bare matter stand. On the other side, very few inflammation was seen with this uh, stand type. And the fibrin deposition was a little bit higher than with bare matter stents, but much lower as compared to the biodegradable polymer-based drug resistance. 
with uh, after several uh, smaller clinical studies we went up to uh, design the largest uh, clinical trial with drug delivery sense for the time is a test five trial a 3002 patient trial with the uh, de novo lesions and you see the randomization scheme here 2002 patients received the uh, dual drug sirolimus probocol eluting drug delivery stent or the viva isar stent and 1,000 patients received the Sotarolimus eluting stent, which was the Endeavor Resolute uh, stent. Here are the main results, the primary results of this trial. And uh, you see here the comparison between the two stent platforms. No difference at all up, up to 10 years of this, uh, of this stent. And most importantly, a very, very low stent thrombosis rate up to uh, 10 years with this stent. So it's less than 2% over 10 years. We looked also at uh, different subsets and you know that diabetic patients are a very important subset because they uh, show a high incidence of uh, adverse outcomes with stents. And here are the patient-oriented outcomes at 10 years from the ESA test trial you don't see any difference for non-diabetics, but you see a difference in favor of the vivo ESA uh, stent in diabetic patients. These are very recent data that are going to be published. Uh, we looked at calcified lesions. You know that uh, calcified lesions is a very challenging subset of lesions for all kinds of uh, stents. And here we compared the myocardial infarction rate between non-calcified and calcified lesions. And you see the difference up to 10 years. And this is a very large cohort of patients, almost 5,000 patients, all treated with second generation drug eluting stent. And most importantly, uh, the comparison between the different stent platforms in this study, we have three uh, stent platforms, by degradable polymer drug eluting stents, uh, permanent polymer drug eluting stents and the polymer free uh, dual drug eluting stent, the Viva Isar stent. And you see that the lowest incidence in myocardial infarction up to 10 years is achieved with the Viva Isar stent. So there are very few trials with 10 year uh, follow up, and most of them have uh, only a first generation. Drag new descent. Let's look at the stent thrombosis rates up to 10 years with these trials. Here are the results from the CIRTAX trial, which compared Cypher with Taxo stents, both uh, second uh, for first generation drag new descent. And you see that the incidence of stent thrombosis up to 10 years was almost 6% with both of them. You see also here the results from the uh, sort out two trial. Here also Cypher and Taxus stands compared. And here you see the difference between Cypher and Taxus, but both of them have a very, very high rate of stent thrombosis up to 10 years with so eight and almost 10% for the Taxus stand. If we put here the results achieved with the Vivo Isar, you see the dramatic difference between them with the Vivo Isar stand having an incidence of lower than Two percent. You know that there have been also other technologies based on the polymer-free uh, concept, and here I am showing uh, the results with the BioFreedom stent. Uh, you know the results have been published in 2020 in New England Journal of Medicine, but the rate of stent thrombosis uh, to one year is much higher than the, with the vivo ESAR, more than 2%. We don't have a longer term follow-up for this stem. So where we are now with the polymer-free drug of this stem? I can summarize that the polymer-free probocol plus serotimus eluting stem, the vivo ESAR stem, offers the lowest stem thrombosis rates up to 10 years. It provides most favorable long-term outcomes in specific patient and lesion subsets, such as diabetic patients and calcified lesions. 
And these results show that the polymers are not needed to achieve good results, which is also the answer to the title of my presentation. But have we solved the problem of instant free stenosis with the available dry load instants? I'm showing here the results from a very large uh, US registry of patients with PCI. And you see that 500,000 patients from 5 million PCIs contained in this registry are patients with instant restenosis. And this uh, represents 10% of what we do in the daily practice. For sure, most of them are drug instant restenosis because drug instant is also the dominating uh, um, stent technology nowadays. But there are still in, in the US uh, coming with the bare metal stent restenosis. And it's not a benign pathology in stent restenosis. You see here that uh, about 50% of those patients presenting with instant restenosis are coming with unstable angina and 10% uh, or a little bit more are coming with STEMI and also about 25% uh, with non-STEMI. So um, the minor proportion of patients presenting with this tenterostenosis are coming with stable angina. So it is an important pathology. And we have also to improve the results in this kind of patients. 2019, we wrote an editorial on the progress in drug and stem technology. And the question was, have we come to the end of the road with this technology? And we concluded that uh, more effective and durable prevention of restenosis will remain a target of locally applied treatments even in the years to come. This will require further improvement in drug and stem technologies, including adequately tailored drug and uh, drug release kinetics, development of new antiproliferative drugs, and metal or bioresorbable stand scaffold backbones. And we have identified a new target in, uh, in, the, um, in our efforts against instant restenosis. This is the TRPC6 protein. Um, we looked at the knockout model for this protein and the mouse without uh, this protein, they showed much less no area as compared to those wild models. Also, we had a very large cohort with more than 3000 patients and we looked at the TRPC6 genotype and those carriers of the ALA, which was uh, associated with a higher uh, plasma level of this protein, they showed also the highest rate of restenosis. We are lucky to have also some inhibitors for this protein, and one of them is uh, shown here. And in cooperation with Translumina, we are looking at, uh, at a model of uh, drug loading stents based on this inhibitor. Thank you very much for your attention. Alfredo, thank you, thank you up much. to you. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. And uh, could I ask you something? Could, could I ask you something? Please, Alfredo. Okay, so basically I would like to understand uh, how did you measure calcification in the lesion where you assess uh, the advantage of, of, uh, of the ESR vivo? So these uh, were all de novo lesions and uh, we have a core lab for uh, evaluating all our angiography. And so this was uh, the classification or the evaluation by, done by the core lab you have seen 5,000 patients. They were patients included in two randomized trials. ESA test four with biodegradable polymer based drug root instance and ESA test five with a polymer free drug root instance. Okay. And this, this work was done before knowing the results. So they were part of the ECRF 
uh, of these patients from the beginning of the trials. Okay, very important, very important issue because uh, uh, we know that this may be a great advantage, especially in the chronic total occlusions, because chronic total occlusion do have in, indeed a lot of calcification very yeah. often. And also, uh, this is the case of the baked patients as well. So these two uh, real entities are very important for us in the case we are treating chronic total occlusions uh, patients. Fully right. Okay, so Robert, would you like to add something? No, 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 no. I let you a uh, great presentation. <laughs> uh, I, I, I let you, uh, I let the faculty and, uh, and presenters, you know, uh, 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 discuss together. You know, thank you. But Al Alfredo, we, we can discuss at the end of the session as okay. uh, planned. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. You. So, if I understood now, is the is the um, time of uh, the speakers, right? There's three speakers. Yes. So we move to Dr. Vijay and Patil, since uh, Dr. Abhijit Palshekar is not here right now. Good evening, Nancy. So maybe you can put it on a slideshow mode. Yeah. So good evening, everybody. I think my voice is audible and I think my slides are visible. It's all good. All right. All Thank good, you. But you uh, put in the in the PowerPoint uh, mode of uh, projection mode. Okay. So with, uh, with the kind permission from all the chairman and the respected moderator, let me start this session with one complex PCI, wherein there was an issue of stent deliverability and we could walk in uh, with a Vivo ESR very easily. And uh, it's, it was indeed very good to listen from Professor Astrati when we had a meeting in 2020, January, before the pandemic started. And Dr. Patil, sorry to interrupt in between. Yeah, we learned a lot from him. And it is always better to, you know, uh, and present him in front of him. So thank you once again, uh, Team Translumina for this opportunity and let me start with my case so briefly the history this is an octogenarian 83 year male who had a recent anterior wall myocardial infarction and he was lies sorry to interrupt in between maybe if you can just click on the slideshow uh, because your slides are not moving Yes, the slide is only the first. We can see only on the bottom. Can you yes. do a slide show? On click, right? on, click on the slide show. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I actually I'm seeing it properly. It's going on the slide show mode. But we can't. Are they moving now? No. So maybe you can stop share your screen again, share it and put it on a slide show. Yes, we can see now. Okay, now it's okay. Go ahead. All right. Are the slides moving well, Nancy? Yes. Yes, all good. All right, yeah. So this is a story of an 83-year male who recently was admitted in a nearby hospital to uh, our tertiary care center with a recent anterior wall myocardial infarction where he was lysed with a retiplase. And then he was actually managed with a non-invasive ventilator for acute pulmonary edema. And he was referred here for further management because he was going recurrent uh, ischemia-induced left ventricular failure 
so they have referred for further management his risk factors included uh, type 2 diabetes and hypertension history for the past 40 years and he was a ex smoker but uh, after having smoked for more than 65 pack years so his uh, left ventricular function was severely impaired with a ejection fraction of 38% and as expected there was a left anterior descending pituitary hypokinesia however the wall thickness was preserved he also had grade 2 mitral regurgitation and at this age it was expected he was having a calcific aortic wall mild stenosis with grade 2 aortic in incompetence with recent left ventricular failure his creatinine was deranged and it was almost around 1.73 mg percentage and with creatinine clearance of just 42 his hemoglobin was 9.8 so after one day of stabilization he was taken for a coronary angiography from the radial root and the right coronary was fairly normal with some distal moderate disease the left coronary was heavily calcified with a long stenosis in the proximal uh, to mid uh, segment the circumflex was also calcific however there was no flow limiting stenosis so his left anterior descending was clearly a uh, type c lesion with almost heavy calcium right from the beginning to mid segment and there was a uh, uh, tandem three lesions with more than 90% uh, luminal narrowing so this was the culprit lesions and the patient was already on non invasive ventilator we have decided that we'll go ahead with this intervention and uh, to just to summarize there were lot of challenges with uh, already a hemodynamic compromise which was happening with pressures around 100 in this acute coronary syndrome patient we know uh, we had to do a, a prompt and fast angioplasty because he was having recurrent heart failure because of this ischemia and uh, he the lesion was clearly heavily calcified uh, with a long and a tortuous anatomy the ejection fraction was again low so there was a challenge to tackle this fast so as to avoid complete uh, hemodynamic support uh, there was mitral regurgitation he was also giving history of recurrent heart failure and cardiogenic shock the creatinine was again a issue now we we know that in this scenario we need to go in fast and come out faster and uh, definitely rota and imaging was not uh, at the liber liberty of uh, use uh, we uh, did think about using rota in this situation but then we decided that we will go ahead with a shock wave which was easily available on a short notice again the support which we generally use in our center was ibp we don't have impella but the ibp was contraindicated almost because of the uh, almost grade 2 aortic regurgitation in this case so uh, we decided to go ahead with the shock wave balloon angioplasty first uh, in this patient followed by drug letting stents and uh, to start with this was a six french femoral access and you could see the lesion again here it was fairly complex uh, uh, as we have seen so we crossed this with our first workhorse wire which was the bmw wire uh, crossed easily however uh, we could not bring in any imaging we knew again we had less time so we straight away thought we will create a passage for the shock wave ptca catheter with a, a non compliant 2.5 uh, 12 balloon dilatation and uh, we could see that uh, there was a waste right in uh, the entire segment of the calcific coronary uh, lesion so uh, we could just pass this balloon so as to create the passage for the shock wave uh, balloon catheter Uh, during this time this patient was becoming hemodynamically unstable of course he was on a non invasive ventilator operating well we avoided the uh, intubation the balloon did not gave the west away so 
it was a fairly a complex lesion but what we could achieve is a sizable uh, tracking of the balloon pt uh, shockwave balloon catheter and uh, you could see this was the control angio after the first uh, balloon uh, dilatation with two or uh, 2.5 12 balloon subsequently we uh, actually we had to give intracoronary epinephrine because he developed hypotension to around 80 and then after getting the blood pressure to around 110 plus we uh, with the help of uh, guide liner guide extension we could track the shock wave uh, ptc catheter of 2.5 uh, 18 and uh, as uh, as expected it gave us gave way the distal lesion uh, uh, almost two uh, two times the energy was given almost 20 uh, pulses were given at the distal critical stenosis in the mid part of the led we had issues and uh, actually after another two pulses the shock wave balloon catheter had a rupture we had to uh, quickly remove it however it just created further passage during the initial pulses uh, then we completed the remaining uh, balloon dilatation with 3o12 uh, 3o8 balloon in the remaining part of the led and having done that completely we try passing the first uh, uh, balloon uh, first tent we took a 330 resolute uh, onyx tent but it could not pass the lesion even with a uh, deep intubating the guide or even using with the guide liner which was already in place so we did uh, uh, another balloon dilatation here with a 318 a uh, 338 non compliant balloon but still could not cross the stent easily now the next uh, stent we immediately uh, brought in was the vivo isar and uh, to our surprise it walked in in this heavily calcified lesion very easily and you can see here uh, actually it, it was deployed very well across the lesion this was the first vivo isar that was 3 into uh, 28 mm it expanded distally very well probably it did not in the proximal uh, part of the segment but with the uh, some compromised hemodynamics we deployed the stent and then we decided we will post dilate this aggressively and uh, this was a fairly accepted result after the first uh, balloon dilatation the second uh, was of course the choice was vivo isar because the first was uh, easily passed so the second was a 332 vivo is are again uh, covering the entire long lesion uh, we could sufficiently overlap it for the two struts and uh, after checking into orthogonal views we deployed it uh, there was proximal uh, mala position there um, under expansion because of the calcium but then we decided we will do that uh, we'll tackle that with the aggressive post dilatation and the post dilatation was immediately done with a 3o8 non compliant balloon uh, we 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 expected there will be a difficulty while crossing the balloon but again we had a guideline or so we crossed it uh, with this balloon and then we entire layer segment was sufficiently post dilated to 18 atmosphere however in the proximal part wherein we could not deploy the pulses of the shock wave there we had some uh, difficulties we brought in the opn nc and then at around uh, 30 atmosphere 35 atmospheric pressure we could track the calcium from inside the stent and you could see uh, finally at almost 35 uh, atmosphere the uh, stent got expanded completely so in all we could use multiple uh, balloon dilatations however this patient tolerated the procedure very well completed the entire post dilatation after crossing the initial difficulties uh, to our satisfaction almost up to 18 atmosphere uh, with a 3.5 uh, non compliant balloon think we lost connection here 
Me too. Dr. Patan? We lost your connection. Let me just check here. Yeah, the, Dr. Patan's screen is frozen. Oh. Dr. Patan, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we lost him. Dr. Patel, maybe you can yeah. just share your screen. Oh, as we we just in just between. I'm so sorry about that technical glitch. Yeah. Slide visible? Yes. 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 Yeah. So, uh, tackling the long lesions, there are a lot of issues. We have procedural as well as clinical challenges. Uh, seen in these these kind of cases, we should have a complete knowledge of stent deliverability, stent overlap, and then the keeping in mind the risk of restenosis, periprocedural MI, uh, and the chances of geographical miss. Now, uh, ideal DS has to be uh, having multiple characteristic, but uh, the more thinner struts actually will allow stent de deliverability, but will make it more. Uh, uh, more and more less uh, radio opaque. Simultaneously, the issues like uh, limiting periprocedural infarction will be easier to tackle when you are using a thin strut DS. Uh, again, longer lesions, there are uh, risk of, you know, I mean, uh, geographical miss uh, if you don't have adequate deliverability. Uh, so, awareness of these lesions is essential for practicing cardiologists in treating these long lesions. And we should be uh, thoroughly uh, knowledge, having knowledge about various stent platforms. Uh, I think uh, I'll conclude my presentation. And if you have any uh, remark, Professor Kastrati. Dr. Patil, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But I think that we should leave the discussion at the end. For sure, I have some questions for you also, but very interesting case. We haven't seen the final result. We lose it. Yes, one second. Patient is doing well for the last six months and uh, uh, he is symptom free is following uh, regularly with us. Thank you. Great result. I think I'll stop sharing my screen, yeah. Okay, thank you. We can move to the next presentation and then we can discuss all together the presentations at the end, right? Yes. So now is the turn of Dr. Priyant Shetty. Okay, please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. It's a uh, privilege to address uh, all of you, uh, uh, all the great masters from uh, Europe and my colleagues from uh, India and uh, Pakistan and the Gulf. So I will briefly present uh, the 10 years data of the ISR test five trial. Dr. Professor Kasrati already spoke about how the VU ISR uh, performs uh, excellently in different complex subsets like uh, calcified, uh, vessels and uh, the diabetic uh, uh, patients. We know the challenges of uh, diabetes and uh, uh, coronary artery disease, how uh, uh, the multiple factors of a diabetic patient lead to complex coronary uh, disease. And these patients have uh, challenging anatomy and uh, uh, also complexity of uh, uh, disease, which uh, 
leads to poor outcomes with the uh, PCI with the different distant platforms that we have had over the over the uh, years and also the disadvantages of uh, polymers that was so well brought out by uh, Professor Kastrati. And this is where a stent like uh, VOISR uh, has some advantages because it, uh, it's a polymer free uh, sterolimic uh, eluting stent system. So, so this uh, particular uh, trial uh, looked at the long term outcomes in diabetic patients with coronary artery disease undergoing PCI, how VIVO as uh, ESR uh, compared with the durable polymer uh, Zotrolimus eluting uh, uh, stent. So, the primary endpoint was a composite of cardiac death, myocardial infarction, and uh, revascularization, and other uh, outcomes of uh, interest were all cause death, uh, any MI, uh, TLR, uh, TBR and definite or probable stent thrombosis. So it was a big trial and uh, there were a substantial number of uh, patients uh, with uh, uh, diabetes in uh, both the uh, treatment uh, arms. And uh, this is how the demographics of the uh, patients in the trial were. And as you can see, the trial included uh, complex clinical and anatomical uh, subsets and uh, most of, a lot of patients were ACS uh, and some with uh, uh, prior CABG uh, as well. So when you look at the 10-year clinical follow-up, uh, you see that uh, VOSR uh, performed uh, quite well against the uh, Resolute platform with respect to all outcomes, all-cause death, cardiac death, any revascularization, TLR, and uh, target vessel re related myocardial infarction, where the, uh, the uh, stent of interest seemed to perform uh, better as compared to the uh, durable poly polymer uh, uh, platform. And if you look at the MACE and all-cost mortality at 10 years in diabetic patients, uh, the, there was uh, comparable outcomes with the two, uh, two stand platforms, and there was a numerically low rate uh, in the VOSR uh, diabetic uh, uh, subset, particularly with respect to target vessel-related myocardial uh, infarction. And most interestingly, as uh, Dr. Kastrasi pointed out, the uh, incidence of uh, stent thrombosis at 10 years in uh, this complex subset of patients uh, was uh, very low, uh, even among the diabetic uh, uh, patients, which is which is a very uh, promising outcome. So the key takeaways from uh, this uh, trial uh, was that uh, it demonstrated low rates of stent thrombosis in diabetic patients uh, at uh, 10 years of 1.2% and a 33% reduction in target vessel related myocardial infarction uh, in compared to the durable polymer uh, stent and a numerically low rate of MACE and all cause mortality in the VOSR diabetic uh, subset. So, so it proves that uh, this is a stent that is uh, well suited for treatment of complex uh, coronary lesions in diabetic patients. So I will present a case uh, uh, not as complex as the one uh, shown previously, compliments to my previous uh, speaker. So this is a 69-year-old male ex-smoker, hypertensive. He had come to us with uh, uh, recent onset angina with uh, worsening and prior to a hospitalization, he had rest anginal episodes. The echo had shown T inversions in the lateral leads, uh, the ECG, and the echo showed regional wall motion abnormality in the apical LED territory with the ejection fraction of 45%. Uh, so, this was his uh, angiogram. I hope you are able to see it there. As you can see, the right coronary artery, it's a very tortuous vessel with uh, multiple uh, lesions all along its uh, uh, length. Definitely not appetizing for a PCI and some degree of calcification also. And this is the left system, complex uh, lesion in the proximal LED as well as in the uh, the uh, distal circumflex, as we can see over here. So we decided that this patient had to go for a, a cabbage. Good distal targets for the surgeon. And uh, uh, we shifted him to the cath observation area. And however, when he was there, he developed chest pain, hypotension, and uh, bradycardia. And the ECG showed inferior uh, ST elevation. Uh, see, we, we just hoped that this would go away with some uh, heparinization, but he was uh, uh, hemodynamics were quickly doing, going south. And uh, so we had to take him back to the cath lab and we were just hoping it wasn't the RCA, but then uh, it turned out that the mid RCA had uh, occluded for some reason when he was uh, uh, waiting in the uh, post-cath uh, area. 
And so, as you can see over there, we have started with the uh, JR uh, catheter uh, and the transradial route. So we had to quickly wire this. So we used a, a Sion wire. We could manage to get the wire down fast. And the vessel opened up. Flow was established, but we couldn't leave it like that. So we had to complete the uh, PCI. So we predilated the lesion. And any further advancement of balloon had to be done with the support of a guide extension catheter, in this case, a telescope catheter. So we prepared the lesion well with the sequential predilatations. And then using the balloon assisted tracking, we got the uh, guide extension catheter midway into the right coronary artery. And with the help of the guide extension catheter delivered uh, to 2.75 by 28 millimeter um, uh, Vivo ISR stents. And then completed the angioplasty with the uh, high pressure post dilatations. with this result. So we saved the day and the use of, a, uh, sorry, it was a femoral root. So with the use of a guide extension catheter with the thin uh, strut, uh, easily deliverable stent, we could finish the angioplasty, uh, though with a little bit of a difficulty. And then the patient for the left system, he underwent uh, uh, interval cabbage after four weeks and he is uh, doing well. So that's the comparison of the pre and the uh, post. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shetty, in very nice case, uh, and also highlighting the issue of diabetic patients, very important issue. And, uh, and, and this topic, of course, is one of the most important issues together with calcification. So uh, if I understood now, if there is a Dr. Pal Shikar, is he with us? So Dr. Gelasi, Dr. Pal Shikar is still not joined because he's right now in a primary case. So we move to our next speaker, Dr. Antonio Trevisono. Okay. Yeah, so, so uh, Antonio, before you start, maybe quickly just to, uh, as uh, the main topic here is, uh, you know, polymer free and vivo ISAR. Uh, and as uh, Professor Castrati, you know, started, you know, by explaining the journey with, you know, biodegradable polymers, and we have our Yukon technology. I think you, uh, you had now good experience, you know, uh, with our Yukon technology, and, and you will present also some, some cases, and, and I think starting with the ISR, ISR test for trial and going through the journey, you know, uh, from, you know, biodegradable polymer and then, and then uh, polymer-free. So please, yeah. over to you. Thank you. Thanks uh, to Just Lumina for the kind invitation uh, and uh, thanks to <coughs> Robert Rotini and thanks to Giuseppe Monita, country manager in Italy for the invitation. We will present, um, as uh, Robert uh, said before, uh, some cases that I performed with u uh, one Chrome uh, and then my colleague, Dr. Madri, will present a case uh, with uh, Vivo ISA. So, uh, Yuvon Chrome uh, PC is the new serial um, uh, saluting um, uh, cobalton chromium uh, stent um, uh, by Translumina. Uh, um, that is uh, has the same uh, um, characteristics of uh, Yuvon Choice, but different uh, platform. Yuvon Choice is stainless, stainless steel, and uh, Yuvon Chrome is cobalt chromium. Uh, Yukon Chrome has uh, also uh, flexible two connector stent uh, design and the same uh, unique uh, micropolar stencil face called peel coated uh, abluminal with uh, sirolimus and uh, uh, biodegradable um, um, uh, biodegradable polymer PLA. The um, features of stent designs allow homogeneous expansion, increase the radial force. 
and uh, flexibility and deliverability and good side branch uh, access. Strat thickness uh, is only 68 uh, micron for the small vessel the size, a diameter from uh, 2 to 2.5 millimeters, and uh, 79 microns from uh, medium vessel design, diameter from uh, 2.75 for 2 um, uh, for, uh, millimeters. In this slide, you can um, see uh, as uh, the uh, microporous uh, sensor face works uh, as a um, uh, drug reservoir uh, and uh, um, uh, polymer, uh, the biodegradable polymer ensures a better budding of the sirolimus to the microporous sensor face and controls the release of the drug. But the PLA is fully uh, degradable according to the Krebs cycle. So uh, the two connector design uh, guarantees uh, maximum uh, flexibility and side branch access, and uh, is, uh, this is good for uh, bifurcation stenting because with the cell circumference uh, up to 18.5 millimeters, the Yukon Chrome PC allows perfect side branch uh, access, uh, which is essential for uh, bifurcation uh, stenting. So uh, let's go with uh, the case presentation. The first case, I will present three cases. This, uh, for me, a simple case, but uh, uh, illustrative of the characteristics of uh, this stand. The first case is a 76 year old male with uh, arterial hypertension, uh, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, and chronic kidney disease. He was admitted to our um, uh, hospital with uh, inferior uh, ST elevation myocardial infection. This is the ECG with uh, ST elevation in the inferior leads. And this is the angiography. And you can see a critical stenosis on a proximal circumflex artery. Uh, and this is the right coronary artery with uh, um, subacusive stenosis on the distal uh, tract. And this is the carpal vessel, so the patient has uh, multivessel uh, disease. So we uh, performed uh, primary PTCA on the right coronary artery, and uh, you can see the implantation of uh, Yukon Chrome PC 3.21 uh, millimeters in the distal tract of the right coronary artery. Uh, post dilatation with an uh, uncompion balloon 3.5 per uh, 15 millimeters, uh, no problem to um, cross deletion with the stent, and also in the, in the distal tract of the vessel. This is the final result with uh, good acquisition of the stent, a good flow uh, distally. And uh, I decided to perform the same procedure also, the PTCA of the um, uh, circumflex artery uh, due to the instability of the patient. And I um, implanted the Yukon Chrome PC 3.5 per 21 millimeters in the proximal part of the um, uh, circumflex with this uh, final result. Second case is a 66-year-old male. Uh, he had the previous PCI on uh, circumflex. Uh, it, it is a uh, uh, diabetic uh, patient and uh, he presented with unstable angina. Uh, the uh, angiography showed uh, a diffuse uh, atherosclerotic uh, coronary disease with uh, um, critical stenosis on the mid-intermediate artery. You can see also in this projection, uh, the stenosis is on the bifurcation with uh, um, a collateral branch of the intermediate artery. Two wires, uh, um, and I implanted a Yukon Chrome PC 2.5 per uh, uh, 16 millimeters in the intermediate artery. A good result uh, without uh, jeopardizing of the collateral branch of the intermediate artery. And I decided to um, leave the, um, the, the bifurcation in this way uh, without um, other uh, dilatation in the collateral branch. Third case, uh, 78 year old male, arterial hypertension. He presented with a stable angina. He had a TCG left bundle branch uh, block and the uh, echo uh, showed uh, reduced ejection fraction 35%. This is the angiography. Uh, you can see um, a diffuse coronary atherosclerotic disease with uh, um, stenosis in the ostia, ostium of the circumflex artery and the ostium of the uh, big uh, marginal, obtuse marginal, and also diffuse disease in the um, LAD. This is also a spider view. 
that confirmed the, the uh, diffuse disease. So uh, in uh, this uh, multivessel disease, but uh, with uh, in, uh, intermediate uh, um, stenosis, I decided to uh, have uh, a functional evaluation of the stenosis, and I um, used the pressure wire um, with uh, and I had uh, so um, functional evaluation in the circumflex artery. And in the LAD, I had uh, not significant uh, values of uh, IFR, but uh, when I put the um, pressure wide the obtuse marginal, I had an IFR of 0 0.81. So um, the, uh, this was uh, significant uh, stenosis. And I performed PTCA in the uh, circumflex uh, vessel um, uh, obtuse marginal. I um, uh, implanted a uh, Yukon Chrome PC 3.5 per uh, 80 millimeters on circumflex uh, obtuse marginal. Uh, I performed uh, uh, post dilatation pot uh, with uh, an accompanying balloon 3.5 per uh, 8 millimeters. And then uh, I performed a final kissing balloon uh, with these two uh, non compian balloon 3.5 per uh, 15 in the um, obtuse marginal and 3.25 per 15 millimeters in uh, uh, circumflex artery with this uh, final uh, good result. In conclusion, my experience uh, started uh, with Yukon Chrome started uh, five months uh, ago. Uh, I started on May 2021, and uh, I can affirm that uh, the strong point of this uh, stand for me are uh, homogeneous expansion, flexibility, trackability, and good uh, set branch access. Um, uh, I think that uh, Yukon Chrome is a good option for complex patients diabetics, uh, acute coronary syndrome, and complex addition, uh, bifurcation, dissolutions, tortuous uh, vessels. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Divisano. Now is uh, the issue of Dr. Who else? Nancy. Ah. Dr. Magri. Dr. Magri. The Ludovico Magri. <clears throat> Dr. Ma Magri, you need to unmute. Sorry. Dr. Yeah, we, we see your slide, but yeah, you need to unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. Can you see the image, the screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. That's an honor for me to be here to talk with the um, to talk in this interesting meeting and uh, with such an important panel with a huge experience in hemodynamic and uh, I'm proud to share my experience with all of you and I um, decided to do this this kind of this kind of, um, of meeting like a real life meeting so I so um, so uh, I, I propose you two cases that I have done in um, one today and one two days ago. So I start with the case of this morning, and uh, this is not a complex case, but this is a complex patient. Uh, we are talking about a 56 years old lady. She has uh, hypertension, long-lasting diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, obesity, she's 120 kilograms, uh, chronic renal failure in dialysis. So it's what we consider a very difficult case, a very difficult patient. 
her, her, her history of um, her coronary start eight years ago. So uh, when it was very young with the multivessel disease, a severe um, disease of all three vessels. In that period, I don't know if it was for a choice of the patient or for um, technical reason, was decided to do uh, angioplasty on all on three vessels. So she performed, she put some stent in LAD, some stent. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Magri. You'll have to click on the video so that it gets played. Yes, I, no, no, I, I just, um, I will do later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so she put in uh, 12, uh, 2014, many stents in all the coronaries. But uh, after that, uh, she had new, very, very um, new intervention with the restenosis and progression of disease. So I just summarized uh, in February, this patient had a restenosis on circumflex that was treated with the non-compliant balloon and drug eluting balloon. And in June of this year, uh, I make this angiogram for a new coronary syndrome. And what I found was this is the right coronary artery. And this is the left circulation. And see the marginal branch is subocluded. So I performed a, an angioplasty with a, a vivo, with a, a Yukon stent, a 2, a 16 with post dilatation to 2.5. 75 in the overlap with the previous stand. And this is in June 2021. This patient yesterday had chest pain during dialysis and um, she had uh, troponin, three of troponin. So to, this morning I put again on the, on the, on the cut lab and uh, I was <laughs> curious to see the result of the recent angioplasty. And also with some well, a small small vessel, very difficult patient, and uh, the result was this. I was very happy to see that the results on the circumflex was still good after, after three months. This is a Yukon two or sixteen. Okay, this is the first case, and the second case is of two days ago. Uh, male patient, 66 years, 66 years old, uh, diabetes since 15 years, treated with metformin. No other risk factor for uh, ischemic, cardiac ischemic disease. He had chest pain the day before the hospital admittance, 13 minutes. It didn't give, it didn't give so much importance to this symptom, maybe because of diabetes was not so important, but the day after, uh, in the morning, yet again, a chest pain. So finally decided to go on an emergency call and, uh, and the arrival in the hospital, the vital parameters were good. Very, very slight chest pain, just uh, few chest pain. And this is the electrocardiogram of the AKG of this patient. And we can see on the electrocardiogram that there is, uh, there are the sign of a subacute uh, syndrome on uh, anterior wall of the left ventricle. This is the troponin of this patient, our friend troponin, uh, 9.1 uh, with the reference maximum 0 0.06. So we put the patient in the cat lab and this is the result. This is the right coronary artery, it's quite good. Some regularity but not stenosis. And I went with the, with the guiding catheter directly on the left circulation, on the left main. The catheter was a little bit selective. There was a small, uh, a short left main, and the catheter was quite selective on circumflex. But we can see here um, some problem on the, on the problem proximal on the proximal LED, not clearly, not clearly seen here, and a tight lesion of the mid, mid part of the LED. On the 
cranial, on the caudal view, <clears throat> we can see better the vision of the proximal LED. And on the cranial view, instead, <clears throat> we can see both the lesion. And in this view, we can we can see clearly that the proximal um, the proximal lesion is much tighter than it seems on the other view, and the other lesion is subocclusive in the mid part here. But we can see also the proximal lesion is very tight. After some difficulty, I put the BM balance meter weight wire on the LAD, and I make a dilatation of the of the distal lesion with the two short catheter to 12. And this is the, the result of the predilatation. We can see the lesion of proximal lesion here. It's much tighter than what it seems in the other view. So I decide, and um, we can see here that the lesion is between two, di two diagonal branches. So I decided to put a small stent. I didn't have the vivo either measure of this uh, of this uh, vessel so i put a create here create evo stand and with the same balloon of the of the of the stand i put i make a dilatation of the proximal lesion this is the the caudal view of the preparation post dilatation of the distal stand and that's the time of our special guest, Vivo Ezer, uh, polymer free serolimus saluting coronary stand. Uh, we were enough lucky to have in our cat lab since four days this kind of stand, some 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 scent of this uh, Vivo Ezer, not all the measure, but it seems to be that was the good the good view, the good moment of putting it. So I decided to put in the proximal lesion. This is a 3.5 or 16. This is the positioning, the expansion of the stent. This is the result after the implanting of the stent and post dilatation with a four non compliant balloon distally and proximally. This is the final result in spider view and in cranial view. The patient, uh, I have done this procedure in the afternoon, in the evening, and the, the troponins rise to 14. And the next day, yesterday was eight, and this morning was three. And what this is, Nice is the, the result on the echo. This is the echo of this morning I've done. You can see the four axis and the two axis. The two chamber, the four chamber and two chamber view is only only a slight, very, very light hypokinesia of the of the apex, hypokinesia of the apex. That seems a good result. I want to thanks to the the team of the cat lab and i want to thank this also to all of you for all the attention thank you and this is has been i think the first vivo ether stand implanted in italy and maybe in europe i think that's correct and nice picture and congratulations thank you very nice Professor Galassi, you are on mute. Yes. So now the next speaker, thank you very much for your kind presentation. Very interesting. And uh, also some questions uh, that we, we have to uh, stress from later. Yeah, end. so Dr. Galassi, Dr. Pal Shekhar is still in the case and he's stuck in that case, so he'll not be able to join. So I think we can uh, open these sessions to the panel discussions for all the cases which has been presented. And uh, we have our expert panel also from India and from uh, we have good uh, friends of us on panel.
So I think we can open these sessions to the discussions. Whatever questions we want to ask to the panel, to the speakers, we can. Okay, so I think that uh, we can start discussion, very interesting cases, and, uh, and uh, as far as I, I could see, um, also uh, the, um, all the speakers brought us uh, uh, rather complex uh, uh, current cases, according to uh, diabetes, always present, classification. So I would like to ask, uh, what I saw basically from the first presentations uh, and also from the two uh, from Italy that basically um, the, the one, uh, uh, the first presentation was uh, by Dr. Patil, uh, I think he was the one that he presented the shock wave. And I think that, uh, or oh, Dr. Shetty was probably the one who presented the. Dr. Patil, Dr. Patil. Dr. Patil. Patil yes. So I, as far as I understood, uh, um, of course, the, the lesion that they were, they were shown, basically they were complex. But as far as I understood, uh, in most of the cases, uh, uh, post dilatation by NC balloons were, uh, were performed. And I would like to know, and I would like to, to, to basically uh, try to see, to, to understand if this is something that you regularly do, and also uh, a part of, of uh, this kind of stance, or if you just regularly do in all your cases, because uh, all the cases that we saw uh, were a part of the one that was used, the shockwave was used, also post-dilatation by NC balloon were performed. So I would like to ask Dr. Patil and also Dr. Shetty, what is their experience for the post-dilatation and post-dilatation? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, we, we, we routinely do post dilatation in all our cases, especially those who are heavily calcified. Uh, generally, when uh, uh, in, a, in an acute case, uh, acute coronary syndrome patients, we would avoid heavy post dilatation because that would lead to serious low flows and then cause you know, periprocedural myocardial infarction. So in those situations only we would avoid, we will take uh, maybe just uh, oversight stent and just deploy at nominal atmosphere and we will only addition if there is a serious uh, or gross uh, uh, stent mala position. But in uh, routine, all especially calcified patients, uh, tortuous, long lesions, uh, the deployment only with, uh, based on the Stent uh, balloon inflations, we would not accept. We generally do routine post dilatation with non compliant balloon to uh, at least a pressure of around uh, 16 atmosphere to 18 atmosphere. Dr. Shetty? Yes, uh, I agree with uh, most of what Dr. Patil pointed out. So I think it is routine practice, uh, not only in our lab, probably world over now. Uh, to uh, aggressively post dilate and try and achieve the best uh, uh, minimal lumen diameters uh, in all the angioplasties because the single most determinant of uh, long term outcomes is the uh, minimal lumen diameter, instant minimal lumen diameter that is achieved. And then uh, with variable lesion compliance along the length of the deployed stent, obviously without uh, adequate post dilatation, uh, you cannot hope to achieve uniform dilatation of the uh, stent. Obviously, uh, but, but recently the paradigm for uh, uh, lesion preparation has changed in the sense that uh, we are using high pressure dilatations to prepare the lesion before uh, deploying the stent and using high pressure, extreme high pressure balloons like uh, uh, open NC in uh, pre dilatation as well to make sure that the uh, lesion, lesion is modified adequately even before uh, deploying the uh, stent. Uh, but even in such cases, uh, we do. Uh, post dilate uh, aggressively to achieve good uh, good results. Please, Anna. So, uh, just I wanted to discuss another issue, not at the end of the intervention or post dilatation, but for the beginning of the intervention. This is a very challenging case. What uh, Dr. Patin showed, in the sense that it was very highly calcified and it was uh, with in, um, hemodynamic 
instability in the patient. So here it's very important uh, what kind of uh, procedure to choose for the beginning to prepare the lesion. Because you should be very fast with the intervention and what is the fast and you should not occlude the vessel during a long time. So, and there are options, rotablation, for example, you have used the ditotripsy, the shock wave. Did you have rotablation in your cath lab? We, yes, sir. We had rotablation standby, but you could see the first injection itself had a slow flow. There was a less than Timitri flow in the, you know, the culprit artery. Yeah. So we thought that we will have to go in very fast. Probably he won't give that time for, you know, uh, uh, rotablation, adequate rotablation. And then luckily we had the PTCA, the shockwave PTCA catheter with us. So yeah. we took our chance and then actually it worked well, very well in the distal part of the LAD lesion. Unfortunately, since the vessel had a bent at the mid part and probably uh, uh, some speck of a calcium wherein the balloon catheter had rupture. So in that uh, very moment, the patient had some hemodynamic collapse further. He was on a uh, noradrenaline support. We had to give intracoronary epinephrine to increase the pressure from AT systolic. So at that time, in a, you know, uh, everything becomes, uh, the pressure starts building up. Then we started that we will quickly push in the uh, stent. Again, it was the best uh, trackable uh, stent, which is supposed to be onyx. We took that stent and it did not cross easily. When we had, luckily, again, there was a guide extension available. So, uh, and to our surprise, it was it was my very first few cases of Vivo Isar, wherein it walked in just like a cakewalk. So that's why I chose to present this case specifically because it, it went, uh, you know, where a uh, uh, stent like onyx could not cross. Okay. I think because uh, issues, issues to discuss are also uh, you need for the shock wave, you need to, to keep the balloon inflated for a long time. Yes, we do. On the that. other side, we, on the other side, you have very often difficulties in passing this, uh, this kind of vision, which is also time. And at the end, you should uh, always consider maybe the time that you need for tabulation might be shorter than for uh, for this, uh, just to think about it. And uh, there are options to, but it's a challenging case and you have to be congratulated. At the end, you had a perfect result. But I agree with Professor Kastrat that the issue of a uh, rotor blader or a shock wave is something that probably are necessary in many issues, in many, time, many times, like in a case like that, but also the instability of the patient should be taken as a main issue because if we uh, treat sometimes a chronic total occlusion, we can work with these patients uh, with rotor ablation, shock wave without any problem because we know that we have collapsed and so we can work in peace and sometimes in a very unstable patient, as soon as we stand up with this uh, ballooning for the shock wave a little bit longer, the patient drops down. And so the <coughs> optimum is then of the better. And we know that it sometimes it's totally another story. So I agree with Professor Krasati regarding the issue that, that definitely uh, uh, both uh, problems of road ablation and shock wave sometimes may be uh, seen uh, more adequately in the in acute case and should be taken into consideration. Um, any other uh, issues from uh, Italian group? Okay, Dr. Alabdali, please, Dr. Ali. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this, and I really, it is very interesting cases I saw. Uh, I don't know, but I will. I will. I will approach the case uh, more different. Uh, that when when uh, when it was mentioned that the patient uh, was quite symptomatic and his they put them on non-invasive uh, ventilation and as well as that patient is symptomatic and uh, his hemodynamics also it's not that good. I will prepare from the start, maybe I will electively intubate the patient and I will pay more attention for the uh, hemodynamic uh, support 
with the uh, inotropic support uh, or vasopressors. Uh, the second thing I will, uh, for heavily calcified lesion, especially uh, in the LED, and you need to put a long distance, a preparation for the lesion should be uh, assured 100%. I know that you mentioned uh, in the middle of the procedure that the patient uh, become hypotensive. Uh, so you have to cut uh, some mid of the uh, procedures uh, steps uh, for this patient. Uh, but I think that uh, if I if, uh, in the start that maybe for me that I will prefer rotor ablation uh, for this lesion because it is heavily calcified, long lesion, uh, and I think that when you mention that the balloon is ruptured, that uh, for me this is an indicator of failure of the uh, mm. of the uh, uh, balloon lithotripsy. Uh, the other thing that I really and I know I know that it is uh, the patient is unstable, but I think I prefer rotor for him. I will uh, I will uh, I will see the person. After uh, after modification of the calcification, I will uh, I will uh, do for him IVAS uh, to see how is the modification of the plaque. Maybe and I will consider for him either cutting balloon or scoring balloon uh, to really uh, make sure that this uh, lesion is prepared uh, very well for the stenting because I will put very long stent and the stent will be, uh, there will be a very uh, high chances in the future that the patient will come with an instant stenosis uh, or uh, thrombosis maybe he will have if there is a malaposition. And I think that post stenting uh, and post dilatation, I will uh, I was the destined to make sure that it is uh, fully expanded and uh, no need for uh, uh, pressure uh, for more uh, dilatation like with uh, NC balloon to go for higher pressure uh, for some uh, part of the stent. I think uh, this is, uh, I will approach this patient. I don't know and what, uh, what my colleague and the other think, but I think I will approach it like this. <laughs> Well taken points. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, definitely IVUS, uh, rotablator, shockwave, uh, non compliant balloons, uh, also the cutting balloons are all devices. Also, uh, the gut liner in some situations are all, all new good uh, devices that can be used. But we agree with you that uh, the acute problems of the, uh, the non invasive ventilation. Uh, Low ejection, low low output. Uh, of course, sometimes uh, totally change the real approach, and so sometimes you need to have a, a sort of procedure that can be even satisfactory, uh, and then maybe optimize later. And and we all agree that probably sometimes the most important issue is to take the patient out from the cath lab with a good, uh, you know, recur, uh, you know, good overall satisfactory procedure because. More and more you work, more and more you do contrast, more and more you try to optimize the issue. Sometimes more you have trouble. So I agree with Dr. Patil that in this situation it was, uh, I mean, the result was good. And I agree with your comments that definitely um, sometimes exactly as you say, we have to take care of the patient rather than the procedure itself. But I would like also to, to ask the Italian group, the Italian people, that they've been trying now this new SR Devo for the first time. How do they uh, uh, realize this stand is, uh, generally speaking, with, with, with their experience with the previous uh, Onyx stand, uh, Xyne stand? Uh, uh, do they find this stand uh, uh, of a good performance? Uh, in this case, they, they, where basically they will try this. It is uh, always necessary the post dilatation, or it is already a good satisfactory implantation by itself? Well, the experience of VivaIzer is uh, this, this is the first one. So uh, is uh, a proximal lesion, not to cross many, many, many vessels. It's, it's a good, it's a good feeling. I mean, 
And um, for post adaptation, uh, in my experience, is uh, I, I try to do every time. Every time after implant of a stent, I do post adaptation, high pressure, uh, non compliant balloon. In this case, the 3.5 maybe was a little bit small, so I prefer to use a 4 for post adaptation, and the final result seems, uh, seems good. Well, this is an important point. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Arnan Castrati what is the idea of, of post expansion and increase of diameter? What is uh, uh, if you choose, for example, a 3.2 vessel and you can expand even further with non-compliant balloon, bigger size, uh, what is the experience? No, you mean for the stand or in general? No, I mean for the stand, for the stand. It's a stand that is uh, pliable to expand all sure. the size sure. by non-compliant so. balloon. We, we have always tried to, to achieve the best possible result, with the, even with the stent. So we try to, to postulate it all, all these cases. And uh, for cases like the case of uh, Dr. Patil, we, we use uh, always the OPN balloon because uh, with that we have much, uh, much better results. And, uh, and also, uh, these concerns about the safety of the balloons, they are not well based because uh, uh, b this balloon, the rupture of this balloon is happening much, much more rarely than with uh, the conventional NC balloon. I would like to, to ask the panel about a very important issue. Um, so, you know, the it's a great interest in the duration and intensity of dual antiplatelet therapy nowadays. And for this, you use, uh, you use the risk profile of patient, the bleeding risk, the ischemic risk. Do you think that the stem type should be part of, uh, of the logic you use for the adapt duration, or you apply the same scheme uh, for all stand types we have uh, in the cath lab. Sorry, do you mean the dual tiplatin therapy for longer time or the same? Yeah. Uh, yes. So okay. you, you put in this algorithm also the stand type or you are based only on the patient risk profile? This is my if question. You want to know my, my answer? My answer is I look for the patient rather than the stands. Because I realized that, uh, I mean, according to my experience, you know, but it's uh, just my personal view that uh, if I have a patient with diabetes, long lesions, and, uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of risk factors that, in complexity, I would always prefer to keep uh, uh, the dual antipatal therapy longer. But I mean, this is just my personal view. I'm not really uh, concerned too much to withdraw the dual antipatal therapy, except for the cases where the patient is needed. And then uh, I always suggest the patient to keep a little bit more, more longer and then to make some follow-ups and then try to uh, stop this antipatal therapy when uh, it is possible to do according to the risk patient's uh, profile. Yes, usually I prefer to follow this uh, uh, dual antipatal therapy according to risk patient profile rather than stand uh, uh, differences. Oh, Dr. Sina? What do you think? Do you use the stand type also as part of this algorithm or not? The question for me? So just to replace him, uh, Dr. Sina seems not to be uh, following us. No. Uh, so Dr. Shetty, please. Yeah, yes, yeah. thank you for the question. So I, I, all, all stent platforms seem to be coming with more and more data about uh, uh, good outcomes with uh, short DAPT regimens in the selected population of uh, uh, patients. So, 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 so the, what it means for us is that uh, depending on the patient uh, risk, we have to decide on the duration of uh, DAPT and not on the type of the stent platform because I think with most uh, modern stent pl platforms, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, events are probably uh, similar. The risk for stent thrombosis, I don't think 
is different from one stent versus the uh, other. So it should be entirely determined by uh, uh, patient uh, uh, phenotypes rather than the uh, stent type that has been used. That, that's what I feel. Dr. Abdali, do you share this opinion? Well, uh, for uh, for my from my uh, my experience and my preference, uh, that I have selection of some type of the stent and to extend uh, the dual antiplatelet uh, according to the uh, uh, to the sometimes the stent type and sometimes the stent uh, how many stents I put in the patient. Uh, really, I'm trying for some patients with high bleeding risk that I will use uh, uh, the stents which has a shorter uh, uh, period of profile that can be used for the dual and platelet. Uh, we have at our institution, we are using uh, all the three, the clobidogrel, the ticagrel, and the prasagrel. Uh, and we are all, we are also the uh, categorizing the patient according uh, uh, accordingly to the uh, uh, the need for uh, uh, for how long that we will keep the patient on the uh, antiplatelet uh, for the dual antiplatelet. Uh, but the things that uh, uh, my experience or my regimen, what I do, and uh, maybe it is right or wrong that, uh, yes, sometimes to some extent, I will increase the, the time for the dual antiplatelet. Uh, you are on mute, Dr. Uh, yeah, I would like to hear your opinion, Dr. Shaikh. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, getting me on this uh, uh, online session. Well, it was a very nice, uh, the cases were presented actually, and nice discussion we everyone had. Uh, well, talking about the first case uh, done by Dr. Vijay, I would definitely like to con congratulate him uh, as he ended up with very good results actually. I mean, with so much uh, heavy calcium, long lesions, right from proximal to mid LED, it was uh, definitely a very courageous to put in a stand. I mean, uh, uh, I would agree with Dr. Ali as well. You need to, I mean, with so much heavy calcium, you need to think five times before getting a stent into the lesion. Uh, because the lesion preparation is something that is so much important in these kind of lesions because uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you sometimes get a stuck up uh, with so much heavy calcium, the stents, even, you know, these kind of lesions, stents get a stuck up and all those things, you know, that you can end up with catastrophe. And um, definitely... With this kind of situation, the patients once becomes very much unstable, so suddenly, abruptly, that you just try to finish up with stenting and uh, uh, getting your good flow into the distal segments, no doubt in it. But definitely, what you need basically is to have a good lesion preparation. But I was very, I mean, kind of, I had uh, an experience of using a Yukon PC before. Definitely Yukon uh, PC did have good trackability, advancement, and good vision as well in long stands like 40 mm stands we have used before. But this, uh, I would like to see how does this uh, Vivo behaves in future. But looking at those lesions in which the way it was put in, I feel that it, it must uh, it must have good results, good trackability, and would like to, I mean, experience it. And uh, once again, I would like to congratulate all the team for uh, like uh, making this uh, <clears throat> webinar for all of us and hope for future, we all shall have these kind of sessions again, sharing our experiences with each other. Yeah. If I may say something, I think that uh, Nowadays, uh, because we have so good device to prepare the lesion, especially in complex situations, 
the most important issue is once we implant the stent is uh, uh, to understand if the stents uh, after in case of post dilatation keeps a very good uh, shape. I mean, I think this is the most important issue. And if we realize that this is the case, usually the stent will have a very good performance. Sometimes you can see uh, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, new uh, uh, quality, uh, not so high standard stents that can be brought on the market and you realize immediately that even if you prefer the lesion, you prefer a very nice, you know, uh, procedure and then you implant the stand, the stand is always not, you know, sub uh, is not optimally uh, implanted. So then you work on the, on the non compliant balloon to try to optimize and you always see, uh, okay, and geographically that there's not so nice the, the picture. And then you go to with the iris and you realize that there's some struts that is not well expanded. So I think that this is the most important issue to understand if uh, uh, the stand is, a, you know, it's a good stand is basically that one. And of course, I think that most is the complexity of the lesion, more you can realize if the stand is behaving nicely. And of course, then we have the issue of thrombosis, we have the issue of wrist stenosis. And again, I mean, in the most complex lesion, you will face the most complex uh, follow-up. And I think that, uh, especially in the longer, in the longer segments, uh, standard. So I think uh, uh, that it's very challenging. I'm really asking now, I will uh, this, uh, I will try to pose, uh, to, to pose this, <laughs> this question to the Translumina people, but I think that uh, once we move uh, uh, to the market, I think we should try to uh, face the most complex lesions and the most complex settings. Uh, uh, and try to see how the stand is behaving, for example, in the bifurcation reconstruction, uh, CTO segments, because uh, if the stand is behaving nicely in this uh, double stand reconstruction and working nicely with, do the, with the dual in the DK uh, mini crash stand or in the CTO long stands, then we will have a very good uh, uh, performance. And that would be I think uh, the most important test for the translumina. So I would really uh, be glad to push uh, this step now in the next step forward and try to see uh, if it, you know, if it's possible to how to behave in this in this uh, complex uh, anatomy. What do you think, Adnan? So the uh, complexity of the lesion is the best stress test for the stand. Yes. We use stress tests for ischemic heart disease. We should use complex uh, lesion complexity as a stress test for the stent. But in our experience, uh, because uh, uh, you are using it for the first time in Italy, but we have been using this for for 15 years now. So we we were very, very satisfied with the device. Yeah, and, and to add to this, you know, uh, you know, from Translumina point of view, uh, uh, well, first of all, I totally agree, and and we have no limitations. Basically, I mean, this is a stand for, I would say, all cover, all comers, and any any type of lesions and indications, and we have we have also plans to uh, you know run some uh, you know post marketing registries, which is also a great you know uh, a way to uh, not only uh, you know challenge the product but also follow the patients. Uh, and, and observe, you know, results, you know, also uh, longer term. So we'll definitely uh, engage, you know, uh, many of you in those, uh, in those key projects. Uh, you know, if, if I may ask one question to the panel, I think we are close to concluding, but, you know, we spoke about pre and post dilatation, which obviously are key. We clearly observe that in most places, you know, post dilatation is, is, is a common, you know, now practice and an important one. But when it comes to pre dilatation, one question is, you know, what about direct stenting? Because we also observe that, you know, more and more people tend to do direct stenting, especially in some, you know, emergency cases. So what, what's your opinion? Where, where uh, direct, I mean, where should we basically, what's the, what are the indications and, and, and where should we prevent, you know, even doing direct stenting, you know, with all the risks associated to uh, poor preparation uh, and potential problems also with the device? Just, just your thought. Robert, I will answer first myself, and then uh, because I'm not the one who is using the, 
Uh, I'm not the one who is using, who is doing PCI, especially in acute phase, in acute case, because as you know, I'm getting older, so they don't call me anymore in the cat lab in the night. So I can tell you that according to my experience, because I treat more and more complex lesions, I always try for myself yeah. to prepare the lesion. So I don't like the idea of the rest standing. But I must say that sometimes I'm facing the issue of cost, and I go some, some time around many countries, as you know, that they have not, you know, a lot of uh, possibility. And when they ask me to, do, you know, uh, to do some cases as a second lesion, third lesion, they say, okay, we use a lot of materials. Uh, we spoke to them and say, what do you think about the rest I say, okay, let's try and to go. Because I know that, by the way, I can always optimize the lesion by afterwards by non-compliance stand. So I would say, that generally speaking, I agree with you and I agree with them. And now we can listen also to the other speakers, what is their, their, their ideas. Generally speaking, if it's a young guy, and it's a few case, probably I would go ahead probably with more uh, for the direct stenting. Uh, I would say more, but uh, generally speaking, now I know that I can always optimize the lesion by non-compliant balloon afterwards. In the past, probably I would have, I would not have done that uh, strategy. I would have kept the strategy of predilatation, because predilatation, by the way, is always uh, very good for for me to understand how does the lesion behave, and then I'm always able to understand better what is to do next. But uh, sometimes in a flat disruption, in a acute case. Uh, the idea of uh, direct stenting is probably the best because you prevent the section going further. And so this is another important issue. A part of limiting the materials also limiting the need of other additional standing. I don't know what are the idea from the panel, but I would like really to, to encourage discussion on this topic. If we have some more, some more time. So um, I'm using the extending and there are two factors that, uh, that uh, I consider before going to the extending lesion severity for very severe stenosis. I don't try it for sure. And uh, lesion calcification. If I think that I can achieve a good result, I go with the extending. Uh, but as you said, uh, Alfredo, you have always the possibility of uh, post dilatation of, uh, of improving the result of the stand. So, uh, you save some money with your extending, but you run the risk of being disappointed at the end of having uh, decided for the extending. But I, I uh, so you said that you are not going, you are not doing uh, acute cases. I am doing some of them despite my older age. So <laughs> you uh, probably you, you are, doing all the elective cases. And uh, in that case, uh, complex cases, calcified lesions, uh, the proportion of the extending is very, very low. Sure. Good. Even to the time, I mean, should we, I don't know, it's up to you, or you we can keep it longer, but- uh, So, uh, <laughs> Robert, if you are not serving dinner, we have to close. <laughs> no, I, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Then I let you. Then I let you make. The, I mean, uh, uh, Alfredo or Professor Castrati, I let you make the conclusion. Alfredo, go on. <laughs> so I think that it was really a nice experience worldwide. This is a very important issue. Um, India, as we know, is a very important. Uh, uh, sort of uh, place where we can have a lot of cases and we know that you are using a lot uh, and we are glad also to have uh, people from Saudi and, uh, and from Italy now that where we are starting to use this device so for sure this will be a nice uh, starting and we we thank uh, Traslumina for that I'm sure that we have uh, now a better understanding of this we will have better understanding of this uh, vivo these are the basically will give us probably uh, more chance to understand this combination of the two drugs. How does it work? How do they work in the real in the real world? And I'm sure that now probably the direction will be 
to, to start to use, as uh, Professor Castati was saying, into the direction of complex lesions, because we know already that this is working. So that would be uh, our uh, test is already done with the Yukon. So now we have to start and try to think directly for the Rivoizar to go for the uh, complexity lesion and try to see how uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, involve more people to work on that. I think that would be, uh, for me, it would be a great pleasure, and I would be glad to be, uh, you know, to, to, to be to follow these cases. Uh, we, we, I thank all the participants to this uh, uh, for the presentation, their presentation, and I'm really would like to uh, ask Adnan Castrati to give uh, some more. Uh, he, uh, more words on the and, and, and also to Robert Rattini, more words on the on the conclusion of this uh, our presentation. No, I have also uh, to thank all of you of <clears throat> your contribution to this session. It was a very interesting uh, session. Uh, I wanted uh, to let you conclude because it is uh, an Italian masterclass, and uh, but you you have to consider yourself. Uh, fortunate that you have now in the hand such a good device such as uh, a Vivo Ezer stand. So, and I wish you uh, big success with this stand, which should come for sure, on my opinion. So, thank you very much, all of you, and have a nice evening and uh, good night to Indian and Pakistani colleagues because they are three or four hours uh, in advance. So see you next time. See you next uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you Bye, very much. much. Arrivederci. Buona, buona serata, Arrivederci. italiani. Arrivederci. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.